Hello and welcome to the Car Kenrod Reviews channel and welcome to the 2023 Hyundai Ioniq 6, a new electric model from Hyundai that is very interesting. In today's video, we're going to do a proper technical review. We're going to look under the hood or the front, under the car. We're just going to talk about this electrical system and then we're going to look, take a look at the outside, the inside and everything around to see if Hyundai did well with the Ioniq 6 or not right after this. Let's start with our technical review under the hood. And you say under the hood, it's an electric car. There's actually a lot of real estate here, similar to that of the Ionic 5 that we looked at some time ago. It is in my opinion, as a repair technician, that electric cars are really gauged, not by how range and all that stuff, that stuff is all good, but from a technical side, they are really judged by how well they do their thermal management system. Because here's the problem that faces every electric car. You don't have a heat generator. There's no gasoline engine that creates heat. And that becomes a problem. The challenge with electric cars is, how do you heat and cool the cabin? And how do you heat and cool the battery and the motors and the inverters that drive the motors without kind of becoming counterproductive and really killing the range? Because people will say, well, we just can turn on some heaters and get it done. The electric, right? Well, that becomes counterproductive very quickly. So they really have to engineer the systems very well to work and work well. We're gonna start with the HVAC system because the HVAC and the cooling system are kind of integrated into each other to make this all work. The HVAC system in this car is a heat pump system. Very brief, heat pump is actually used in cars and then actually houses as well. It basically takes the normal AC and flips it. So now the heat goes inside and the cold side is outside. That's, we're not gonna get too much into it because things are extremely complicated and we're gonna make them a little simpler so we can all understand. So this car has two cooling systems that use coolant other than the HVAC. The first cooling system is for the battery. Only, doesn't do anything else but the battery. We're going to hold that thought for a moment as we go through the components. The second cooling system, which is completely separate, has its own radiator, it has its own water pump, just like the battery system. It also has its own radiator and its own water pump. So now we have two radiators. Let's start that count because many people say electric cars don't have radiators. They actually have more than gasoline cars. The second cooling system, it's for the motors, the drive motors and the inverter, which is the part that drives the motor or switches to charge the battery when you have regenerative braking. And then that system also cools the integrated or the onboard battery charger. This does have DC fast charging, so that is a pretty big charger that gets pretty hot. Now that we understand the HVAC system, what its type it is and what the two cooling systems, let's dive in and kind of talk about how they all work together, starting with the HVAC system. So electric cars will have modes. They're called modes of heating and cooling. Let's talk about the first and easiest mode. If you want to cool the cabin only, that's a very simple mode. That actually operates exactly like a gasoline car. This does have an electric compressor that operates exactly the same, like a normal gasoline car. It's gonna take that refrigerant, send it to an evaporator inside the car, and then it comes back, condenser in the front, big condenser in the front, so that's radiator number three, and the cycle continues and everything is very normal. But then there's a second mode to, to the cooling function. What if we want to cool the battery? So here is how it does this. It doesn't actually send refrigerant inside the battery to cool it. That's when the cooling system of the battery comes in. There is a point called the battery chiller where the coolant for the battery circuit and the refrigerant, they come in contact or not contact directly, but through a heat exchanger called the battery chiller. So when the battery starts to get hot and we need to cool it, the first step is, it's gonna actually start cycling coolant through the battery. And then if it really needs to, it's gonna send that coolant to the radiator in the front, to its dedicated radiator to get cooled. 
But if things get too hot, and we really need to rapidly cool that coolant because now things can't keep up, it's actually gonna use that battery chiller and start you routing some of that cold refrigerant to that battery chiller to take some of that heat from the circuit of the coolant of the battery. And that's how it, the two modes, it depends. If things are not extreme, we don't really need to the refrigerant. If things get extreme, we use the refrigerant and then we route the coolant to the front radiator to get cooled. Pretty cool how they do that. Then we move to the, what I call the danger zone of electric cars. When things are too cold, see, when things are too hot, they don't just get hot all of a sudden, they gradually get hot and the computer can manage because you have refrigerant that is cold. But what about when things get cold and you need to heat things up? That's when things get tricky, let's dive in that. So this has a heat pump system. The first mode of heating is just heating the cabin. Things are very simple, life is wonderful. To heat the cabin, we're gonna flip the operation of the AC system. This is super complicated and it doesn't really work like that in the real world, but we're gonna keep things simple here so you can follow and understand it. So instead of sending the low pressure cold refrigerant inside the car, we're gonna actually let that be outside the car and we're gonna send the high pressure hot refrigerant inside the car to give the cabin warm air. But the way they do that is not, they're not gonna just send that hot refrigerant to the evaporator that every car, even gasoline ones have. They actually have a separate condenser inside the car. So now you don't have really a heater core, you have a condenser inside, which is also a little radiator, but instead of coolant going through it, you have refrigerant going through it that is at high pressure and it's hot, and that's what's gonna warm up the cabin. Now, the second function into that heating system. What if we need to heat the cabin and the battery? Because lithium ion batteries are very tricky. You can't have them run too hot, but you can also cannot have them running too cold. You want to keep them at the optimum operating temperature. So here's what's gonna happen when we need to warm up the battery. We're actually gonna send hot coolant to the battery. And the way it does that is when things get a little complicated and, and just a little bit too much. There is a third component called the liquid to liquid condenser. It's actually not even a condenser. It doesn't do anything of that nature. All it does is it crosses the three systems. So you have the AC refrigerant, the coolant from the first cooling system for the motors and the inverters and the charger, and then the coolant from the, the battery. It go, all of them go through this heat exchanger. So whichever one is hotter is gonna heat up the other one. So in the case when the battery is cold, they're actually gonna rely on that hotter coolant and hotter refrigerant to warm up the coolant for the battery, which then goes and warms up the battery. But here's where the compromises start, because that sounds great. But did you know that the heat pump system actually has a limitation, which is extreme cold temperature? So when things are extremely cold, it no, no longer function. So what are we gonna do to heat up the cabin? And worse, what are we gonna do to heat up the battery? Because we are relying on this hot refrigerant to warm up the coolant for the battery. So what are we gonna do? Here is where they took the easy way out. And this is where Tesla does things a lot better because their system, it just does magic with thermodynamic laws to really get squeeze every bit of heat and keep things going. Here, they kind of went the easy way out, an efficient way. If the system is incapable of warming up the cabin, there's actually an electric PTC heater that comes on and warms up the cabin until things catch up at the expense of drawing significant amounts of power, which kills your range. And then the battery, what are we gonna do if this battery is too cold and we can't heat it up? You actually can't have that in electric cars. That's not a viable option. You have to warm up that battery. They're actually gonna turn on a PTC heater to warm up the coolant, which then warms up the battery. Very inefficient and it's the easy way out, but that is the limitation of this system. So this system will work great in normal temperatures, cold temperatures, hot temperatures, but anything extreme, especially extreme cold, the range will severely be compromised, and that is the problem. Now here is the kind of the bottom line of this system. Just looking around and inspecting everything, kind of looking at, to see where this is at compared to the Tesla system. The only problem I see with the system, it feels in its infancy, and 
when we saw that with the Ionic 5, it was okay. They're starting out. This is a later model, and I see similar trends. So things are extremely busy. I mean, you look at this little sandwich warmer they got under the hood. I call it that because this actually will get a little hot. So if you leave your sandwich here, eventually it'll warm up. So there is a maze of hoses, and there is so many radiators in the front, and there is so much integration, different components, components, and just just too busy. If you compare that to a Tesla system that is so well packaged, it's just amazing the difference. And the other thing is the inverter is massive on this, and that's another thing that was kind of surprising. But to give it a comparison to the Tesla system, even though everything we have reviewed so far haven't even come close to the, for example, the Octo valve from Tesla, this has three distribution valves, three way, three three-way valves, two of them for coolant, one of them for refrigerant, but they're scattered everywhere, and then you have the liquid to liquid condenser, and it has a lot of hoses going to it. There's a lot. The, the bay here is very, very busy with things that could have been condensed and kind of done more efficiently and better. And then there is three radiators in the front. There's a condenser, there's a radiator for the coolant circuit for the battery, and then there's a radiator for the coolant circuit for the motors, the inverters, and the charger. Very, very busy. And that's why what I mean by the system is it's in its infancy. They haven't compacted and kind of packaged things better. Now, charging on this, this is something very interesting about this. I think one of the best things about this system is the charging efficiency. So this does take fast charging, DC charging, which is very good. A lot of electric cars actually do not still. So you can charge this from like 10% to 80% in 18 minutes, which is very impressive. However, I have to say one thing. They kind of sacrificed battery life to do that. And just for your general information, all electric car owners or shoppers, you need to know this. Fast charging a battery is never good for the life of the battery. So that's the compromise here. If you find yourself not in a rush and you really have the time, you can slow charge it at a much lower charge. It's actually better for the battery. Just so I thought I'd include this so you would know. So the fast charging in this, 18 minutes, very impressive. If you're in a crunch, but normally you keep charging it like this, you're gonna severely compromise the life of this battery, and that is the catch. But overall, driving this system, it's very smooth. Of course, this car is very fast, all electric cars are. And the best thing is it holds its range very well. Some electric cars that we reviewed, you turn on the HVAC, all of a sudden your range just significantly drops. And this one, it drops a little bit, especially in hotter climate, but not something significant. And the range is true to the advertised number, so that is very good. That's usually the first thing that is important. Now, this does have multiple configurations of powertrain. So you have the standard range, the long range. This happens to be a long range one. And then you have rear wheel drive or all wheel drive. This also happens to be an all wheel drive. We'll look underneath it a little bit. But the all wheel drive model, will basically add the front motor and the front inverter. The rear-wheel drive model, which is all of them, they all look the same in the back, they will have the rear motor in the back and the rear inverter in the back. Let's take a look underneath the Hyundai Ioniq 6. So the first thing is, this is an electric car, just like all electric cars, everything is completely covered up. They really want to get every bit of aerodynamic possible and having the car flat belly, if you would, makes that happen. Now we do have a cover here. It is removable for service. And you might say, what service an electric car? There's still oil and coolant. And as we talked about, there's a lot going on here. But before we move on, let us look at the front suspension. So steel lower control arm with a separate ball joint which is actually a good design here if you want to replace the ball joint you're not replacing the entire control arm single piston caliper understandably so usually electric cars don't really need huge brakes because they have really good regenerative braking now it is an aluminum knuckle which is something with the automotive industry that one day in the future this steel bearing will weld itself with the similar metals that is the downside of it this particular one is all-wheel drive so you see the axle the axle is actually a decent size in the front all electric cars will have really oversized axles because of the instant torque 
This is a typical McPherson design in the front. Things are very basic and simple. Actually, this could be a Sonata or an Elantra for, you know, if you're looking at it from outside, there's nothing really special or different about the front suspension. Now, as we move a little bit back, this of course has electric steering. You can see the tie rods right here. But moving past that to this, this is where all electric car magic is. This is the battery. You notice it runs the width of the car and the entire floorboard. This is a very large battery and it's very well protected. This sounds, this is the sound of quality right here. Of course, you do have to protect these batteries real well. There's a service opening here and there's another one in the back. This is where everything connects to it. Now, one interesting observation here, this I think is done better. We looked at the G80, for example, there's openings all over the place. This one is done better because this car was designed from the ground up to be an electric car. So you look at things like the beginning of this reinforcement rail, it is all covered up and that's how it should be. Yes, we do have these openings, but these actually do not go inside this rail. But then as soon as I say that, we look at this where it's wide open and all debris will get here and go on top of the battery, which once you remove this battery, it'll be a giant mess. But again, they uh, could have covered this up, put a little cover, they didn't, and that's okay. As we move past that, of course, this is an electric car, no exhaust, no fuel tank, none of that stuff. You have the battery kind of taking the whole space. We look at the rear suspension here, there's something very interesting. This, is, this control arm is aluminum, and so is the knuckle. This is signs that they're really trying to find any little weight savings to get this better range, and you see that here. And even these stamped steel control arms, they're not, they're kind of hollow. They're trying to save as much weight as possible. You notice the rear axle is very thick, actually, for a car of this size. This is, again, an electric car. You have instant torque, and you kind of want that beefy axle to be able to take that. This car in its normal configuration is rear wheel drive. You add an option for all wheel drive. So normally all of them will look like this. The front is an add on option. Now there's something of an observation as a mechanic looking underneath here, things feel a little better than other Hyundais that we've looked at. The covering here, you notice we always have this concern with this being wide open. You notice this one's completely covered up and that is a good thing. And the materials here of these covers, they're actually not bad and they're good quality. So they're coming up. I do have one concern, one small one in the front about the coverings. So we covered this entire thing, but we left this area right here wide open. If we bring the camera around right there, I mean, that is your compressor right there. That is the compressor. They could have put a little cover there to cover it up from weather, from debris, whatnot. They didn't. And the same story on this side, it's just wide open. You don't really have any coverings of any shape or form. That is the only concern I have with this. Otherwise, things look well. I really like how heavy duty this cover is. Granted, most electric cars are like that. However, we looked at the Genesis, didn't look as well planned. But the best thing about looking underneath this car is this car was designed to be an electric car from the ground up and it shows. Things fit well, doesn't feel out of the ordinary or whatnot. Now, something we missed in the bag, sorry, we're going back and forth. It's hard to see it, but this is the rear drive motor. If we look at it right here, you can see the edge of it. It's an enormous unit. This is where the electric motor is. This is where the inverter sits on top of it and then the final drive is right here. That's where the axles come out. Pretty interesting, very well packaged up where it didn't intrude on the passenger space like the G G80 we looked at. This is very nice. Let's take a look at the exterior of the Hyundai Ioniq 6. Then one thing has to be said, this car, it does look pretty good. Doesn't look like a quirky, weird electric car. Actually has a pretty interesting look. And the reason for that interesting look is maybe this particular car has a little bit to do with it, but hey, if they're gonna be inspired with the design of this car, at least they picked good looking cars to begin with. Now let's start with the front and there is a little bit of a fascination with blocks, kind of like the Ionic 5, which this one looks a lot better than the Ionic 5. You notice there is blocks everywhere. You're gonna see this all over the car. And there are a few more interesting things. First, 
this is the Hyundai special. The radar sensor is super low, so anything that hits the front bumper, the radar sensor gets front row seat. And then this has active flaps, which is a very smart idea for electric cars because most electric cars, they have nothing. Uh, this thing has more radiators than your average gasoline car, so you do need the cooling. So this has these active flaps. You see it open on this one, but if we look at that, at that other car that we have here, they're closed. And as soon as you start the car, they actually open up to let air in. That is pretty cool and they are active, so they're on demand, they'll come on and off. I think that is, first, it looks super cool. Second, it is super functional and it completely blocks any airflow from the front because you do need a lot of airflow for these electric cars. People assume they don't. They actually need more airflow than gasoline cars. But as we wrap around the side and we look at this, this profile of this hood, again, they are uh, perhaps slightly trying to copy somebody, but hey, at least they picked somebody good to copy. Very interesting shape and a shape that is unmistakable for anything but a Porsche. We have to say it, they really took a lot of design cues. That's why this car, I think it looks pretty good. There's then interesting little stuff. This car has very aggressive region braking and works really good. So the brakes will last a very long time. But even though they have that, they actually have a brake vent right here. It comes from the bottom and it, it picks up the air right there. It's pretty interesting to see that in an electric car. I mean, usually they don't really warm up their brakes that much. But then more on the little stuff. I don't know what happened here. I feel like the designers of the bumper decided we're going to do a flare arch and then halfway through they just decided, nah, we'll just cut it here. It kind of looks odd, but that's just how they decided to do it. As we move around and we look at the uh, mirror, again, you have these blocks, the turn signals. Pretty interesting that they really carry, care a lot about these blocks. Now, the sunroof. This model does not have a sunroof. Looks great. This model has a sunroof, but then it's a very strange orientation. See, they put this, which is a piece of glass, and then this looks like a huge sunroof. Yet you look inside the car, it's actually one of the smallest sunroofs I've seen in cars. I don't know why they did that and why it was necessary to put that front piece as glass. I mean, that is a very small sunroof and it's way pushed back. I don't know why they did that. That's how they decided to do this. Personally, I'd rather have the one without a sunroof because it actually takes a lot of real estate from the headroom and we're gonna kind of compare the two. Then the door handle. And the door handle has a conversation in its own this is the modern times. As soon as you approach this car, the door handles will pop when they recognize the key. It's very simple. The cool thing here is, this is actually a mechanical door handle. It is not electric. The only thing that is electric about it is when it pops out. That is a good thing because this is a car made for the real world. This is not some, you know, exotic car or whatnot. This is a car people will drive every day to work. If the battery dies, all you got to do is push this, force it open, and then this is a mechanical door, and that is a good idea. Now, behind this mechanical door, and at least in the driver's area, you have a keyhole. Again, another thing that you want, should the battery, 12-volt battery, dies, you know, after all, it's a car. You need that battery. Well, how are you going to get in it to pop the hood to jump start the battery and start the car. Well, here's what they did. And this is where things get extremely interesting. So every single review you're gonna watch of this car, they are very proud of this key, that it has the Hyundai logo. Here's the problem though. They spent so much time on this key and I can imagine they had a little sit down and they were celebrating this brilliant design that the key looks like this. And then somebody in the back of the room decided to, hey, we did not put a metal key to operate that when the battery dies. So they decided to add this, which is a super flimsy cover that pops out and reveals the metal key. See, this is the problem with stuff like this. People get super excited about it until the real world comes in. I think this is a very poorly designed key just for the sake of looking cool because first it's huge and it's unnecessary to be this huge and then you have to carry this with it so that makes it even bigger. I think that was kind of a silly thing for them to do, honestly. Moving on from that to another silly thing. 
the shark fin. They decided to make the shark fin see through. I don't know why anyone would want to see what's inside the shark fin. It's just an antenna. It has a GPS antenna, it has a Cyrus XM antenna, and just a regular radio antenna. They decided to make it see through. It's kind of interesting and it never matches the body color, which I wish it does. Then it would kind of blend in and seamless. This one is red. You see it there. We look at the, this color, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Same thing. It's black in color and see through. I, don't really get that. Moving on from that, you look at the side profile of this car, you assume this is a hatchback. Well, actually, it is not. It's a sedan, but it has kind of that swoop design. And the back, I think the back looks really good. And again, heavy emphasis on that what company they're kind of taking cues of the design from. Because look at this. Right in the comments right now, what does this remind you of? I already see the 911 in it. But hey, if you're going to copy somebody, at least you copy somebody that knows how to design a good-looking car, because this is a very good-looking rear end. It's just striking in a way that is interesting. You see those blocks that carry all over, all over the side? It's the bar taillight, which is very cool. And you see Ionic 6 written here, kind of inside the, the glass piece. Looks very, very nice in the back. That has to be said. And of course, this being a sedan, you have a button right here. Power trunk which is pretty cool. Now the trunk size is not the biggest in the planet and I don't understand actually why. There is such a huge protrusion here that kind of limits the side of the trunk and because this this back of this car kind of slopes down you really can't put anything high here. So you really the highest thing you can put is here and this is just smaller stuff. That's the compromise with this design is it it, it intrudes on your space. Now, this, of course, being electric, doesn't have a spare tire. You only have the charger and a little storage bin and, of course, the inflate kit. But uh, something interesting here. This is sedan, and this is not very common with sedans. You have this button to close it and this one to lock the doors. So you basically hit this, and now it's going to lock the doors and close the trunk. So now you can walk away from it. Don't have to worry about locking the doors, which is pretty cool. Now, there is something very interesting about this one. We happen to have two of these, and very nice viewer brought us this car, and we happen to be reviewing this one, so two in one, we can check out two models. This color is called Transmission Blue. Now, when you hear that, it sounds like your transmission just blew up, but no, this is the name of the color. This doesn't have a transmission, so that's good. We're in good shape. I don't know why this is called Transmission Blue, but it looks like a gray, silver, gunmetal something to me, but Transmission Blue, ladies and gentlemen. That's what this color is called, and it's actually a fabulous looking color, and the truth have to be said. And lastly, the charge port. It's a very interesting shape because it's curved like this. Just cosmetically, it looks really cool, but there's something cool about it. It's power. And the way they do that, and then there's another button that closes it. I really like how they do this because you just push on this and it opens. What is actually happening is if you look here, they have a little button, plastic button right here. So when you push this door, it's actually just pressing this button that opens the door, which is pretty cool. It's just a little design thing that is very interesting. This shows you kind of an overall charge level. And then if you need to DC charge it, you do have the plug. So. This is a very, very cool design piece. Doesn't feel flimsy. I like that it's power, so you're not kind of slamming it and everything, but I'm really fascinated by it. They, look, they put the little blocks here. They're the blocks that they're really fascinated with. They put them here, and uh, that's a very cool charging port. Let's talk about the interior of the Ionic 6. And something I have to be said, here. This is a nice interior. And what is nice about it, it's not really materials and fit to finish, because that is actually not very good, but it feels like a normal car. You get in here, shifter is the stock, which we'll talk about in a second, but all the other controls are typical Hyundai stuff. There's nothing really spaceship about it. And that makes the experience of driving this car a normal one. You don't have to really think. Everything is simple. Everything is laid out exactly as you would find in any other Hyundai model. 
And that is the good thing about it. Seats are very comfortable. I like the visibility is very good. You look at the HVAC controls. They're all right here. They're not physical buttons, but they're like this little touch capacitive thing, but it's right in front of you. You don't have to go through the screen and do all that to operate them. Very simple. And just like other Hyundai stuff, when you put, put it on auto, you actually have three modes of auto. Do you want the fan to be normally high or normally medium or normally low? That is actually a pretty cool function. And then your heated and cooled seats. You do have a little shortcut here that brings it up on the screen. I wish they were also buttons, but that's what they did. But at least you have a shortcut that you immediately can go to and see. And then you have your radio controls right here, which are very clear physical buttons. Love that about it because it makes operating it very simple. This does have a start button. So there we have. The shifter is an interesting shifter, and this is similar to the Ionic 5. So it's a stock, but the stock itself doesn't move. You actually only, the end of the stock move, and it's such a weird orientation. You have, like, most people, up is reverse or switch it up, down is drive, and you push the button for park. This one is opposite. I can understand where they were going with this, where you push it, where you're going forward and back but it throws you off for a minute until you get used to it. So if you get in one of these, focus on that because you could easily put it in the wrong spot if you're just going by muscle memory. Now, the gauge is a giant screen that is, for lack of a better word, completely useless. It doesn't really do anything, but when you turn your turn signal, it shows you the blind spot, which, again, every single Hyundai with a screen does, but otherwise doesn't do much else. Infotainment system is very standard Hyundai infotainment system. Very featureful, but it is glitchy and kind of, especially on the start, it's very slow to start and kind of start going. And the surprise is, this is a very modern car. It doesn't have wireless Apple CarPlay. That was kind of a total afterthought, but that's what they decided to do. Something interesting they did here is the window switches are here, not on the doors, which makes the door have this massive grab handle that just extends the whole length of the door, which is pretty cool. This does have the ambient lighting and all the stuff that is meant to distract you for the main thing of driving. They're very customizable. Not really into those stuff. Called me old school. Now, the sunroof is a very strange orientation. So when you look at it on the outside, when we looked at it earlier, it was massive. But here, it's tiny, it's way pushed back, and it really drops this the headroom here. I mean, on the other car that doesn't have it, it's a lot roomier than this one. This one feels like it intrudes a lot of the interior space. Now, the overall build quality and kind of the fit and finish and materials, they're just okay. I mean, there's some rattles, there's some cheapo panels that just don't feel like they're uh, very well made. The fit and finish, hmm... It's not bad, but it's also not great. This is something you expect from Hyundai. They're not really big on this. And this is not a luxury car, even though it's priced like one and it looks like one. It is not. This is an A to B car that is just electric. That's why they're a little bit more expensive. And this is something we normally don't do in our reviews. A really nice viewer brought us this Ionic 6 as well, which is a lower trim than that one. This one doesn't have a sunroof, doesn't have 360 camera. It is a lesser trim. But you know what? Sitting here, and this is what I like how they did this. You sit in a lower trim car, usually half the options are gone. It just feels completely different. Of course, when they give you the press car, they give you the nicest one with all the options. But sitting here... All of the options that I like about the Ionic Sys are here. You still have that auto climate control that has three levels. You still have most of the amenities. Yes, you lose your 360 and the turn signal that shows you on the screen. You do lose the sunroof, which actually takes a lot of space. This feels a lot more spacious. But the one thing I like about this is, and this is the same thing with the other one, we just switched to this car. The storage in this car is really well optimized. When you have this kind of floating center console and then you have storage underneath it, the center console lid is big. You have storage on the doors. This is a very functional interior in addition to it being comfortable and easy to use, which I really like. And this color, while it will be extremely difficult to keep it clean, I really like it. It, it really brightens up this car in a way that I just didn't see until we saw this interior, which looks actually very nice let's talk about the back seat of the ionic 6 i'm 5'7 this is my driving position i mean this is a very roomy back seat very comfortable my thighs are actually on the seat which is nice and the biggest thing about this back seat is there is no hump in the middle because this is an electric car there is no transmission there's nothing so this flat floor makes this 
a lot more usable as a back seat than any other car, honestly. And the nice thing is you do have some USB chargers here, USB-C, and then you do have rear vents, which is nice. And then the window switch on the back door is on the door itself. And you, but you still have this giant handle, which is nice. And then you have this little tiny little pocket here to put maybe your phone or something. And it's pretty nice back seat. Plenty of headroom. However, the model without a sunroof will have a little bit more headroom. So if you have taller folks sitting in the car, or if you are taller, perhaps skip the one with the sunroof because you will have a little bit more headroom. Let's talk about some things I do not like about the Ionic 6. The first one, possibly the biggest one, the powertrain. It just feels rudimentary. It feels like it's in its infancy. When you compare this to a Tesla, which is not really fair comparison, Tesla's basically, they made the electric cars mainstream. Their system is so good, it makes this looks like it's a prototype. Things are very busy under the hood, and there is a lot of things that could have been combined, made smaller, made better or more efficiently. They didn't, and that's the biggest concern with the Ionic 6, similar to the Ionic 5. And then the second thing is more on the car to live with every day. It is not a luxury car. Although it gives the vibes and indications that it is because of the options and the look, it is not. So it is very loud. I mean, electric cars normally are quieter, but you take this on a highway drive, it is extremely loud. And the last thing is, which might be something minor and eventually you get used to, the shifter is strange and it does take you a minute to get used to because we're all used to kind of a column shifter. You push it down and goes into drive, push it up and goes into reverse. This is backwards. So just be careful when you first get in one of these because it'll get you. You'll throw it in reverse thinking it's in the drive until you get used to it. So should you buy a 2023 Hyundai Ioniq 6 or should you settle for something like the Tesla Model 3? Folks, this is not a bad car. They really did well here. And the one thing they did well, Tesla doesn't do well. This is a normal looking car and a good looking one, in my opinion. This feels like a normal car. Yes, it is electric and they, it's not like a gasoline model that they changed to electric. This is only electric. Feels like a normal car, doesn't take you much to get used to it. Yes, the materials and some of the fit and finish inside is not the best. Yes, the shifter is weird. Yes, it is super loud at highway speeds compared to others, but overall it is easy to operate. But then even with all that, should you get this or the Model 3? Folks, the Model 3 or Teslas in general, all Teslas, when it comes to the powertrain or the electric system, they are leaps and bounds ahead of everybody, and of course, including Hyundai. Tesla makes this system feel very rudimentary, very old, and very in its infancy. It doesn't feel like fully developed. And that's why you don't have a large front. That's why there is a lot of real estate going on, and that's one of the problems. And the other thing is, even though the interior of most Teslas, including the Model 3, feels like it is put together with the finest, cheapest, super glue and some zip ties. This is not exactly a handmade masterpiece. So there is that. However, there's one thing about the Tesla Model 3 that is also a lot better than this, the screen and the software it uses. Tesla in that department and in the powertrain department, they are way ahead of this. And the other problem this car has against the Tesla, Tesla Model 3 prices came down. So when you option this out, you actually, kind of drive yourself into a price range higher than the Model 3. And that is the other consideration. But where this truly does things better than the Model 3 is when average Joe wants to buy an electric car, doesn't really want the quirky looks and the weird operation and everything. They just want a normal car that is electric. This is where this shines because it looks good. Looks are objective. The inside feels normal. You just open the door with a similar key, just like if you had any other Hyundai model, the infotainment system is the same. The way it drives, yes, the shifter is a little strange, but you get used to it. But everything else operates exactly like a normal car. Nothing strange about it. And that is what people will be drawn towards. And that's where Tesla stubbornly does not want to change. Average Joe is more than 90% of people that drive cars and they don't want to spend too much time figuring out how to operate a car. And in this department, this is where this does things better than the Model 3. 
Folks, I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. And until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.